خلقنا الإنسان في كبد أيحسب أن لن لن يقدر عليه أحد أيحسب أن لن يقدر عليه أحد يقول أهلكت ما يقول أهلكت ما للبدا أيحسب أن لم يره أحد ألم نجعل له ولسانا وشفتين وهديناه النجدين فلق تحمى العقب فلق تحمى العقبة وما أدراك ما العقبة فك رقبة أو إطعان من الذين آمنوا وتواصوا بالصبر وتواصوا بالمرحمة أولئك أصحاب الميمنة والذين كفروا بآياتنا هم أصحاب المشأمة عليهم نار مؤصدة صدق الله العلي العظيم الفاتحة مسبوقة بالصلاة على محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين صلى الله على محمد وآل محمد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد نويت أن أزور سيدي ومولاي الإمام الحسين أصالة عن نفسي وعن والدي ووالد والدي ومن قلدني الزيارة السلام عليك يا أبا عبد الله السلام عليك يا ابن رسول الله السلام عليك يا خيرة الله وابن خيرته 
السلام عليك يا ابن أمير المؤمنين وابن سيد الوصيين السلام عليك يا ابن فاطمة سيدة نساء العالمين السلام عليك يا ثار الله وابن ثار والوتر الموتور السلام عليك وعلى الأرواح التي حلت بفنائك عليكم مني جميعا سلام الله أبدا ما بقيت وبقي الليل والنهار يا أبا عبد الله لقد عظمت الرزية وجلت وعظمت المصيبة بك علينا وعلى جميع أهل الإسلام وجلت وعظمت مصيبتك في السماوات على جميع أهل السماوات فلعن الله أمة أسست أساس الظلم والجور عليكم أهل البيت ولعن الله أمة دفعتكم عن مقامكم وأزالتكم عن مراتبكم التي رتبكم الله فيها ولعن الله أمة قتلتكم ولعن الله الممهدين لهم بالتمكين من قتالكم برئت إلى الله وإليه برئت إلى الله وإليكم منهم ومن أشياعهم وأتباعهم وأوليائهم يا أبا عبد الله إني سلم لمن سالمكم وحرب لمن حاربكم إلى يوم القيامة ولعن الله آل زياد وآل مروان ولعن الله بني أمية قاطبة ولعن الله ابن مرجان ولعن الله عمر بن سعد ولعن الله شمرا ولعن الله أمة أسرجت وألجمت وتنقبت لقتالك بأبي بأبي أنت وأمي لقد عظم مصابي بك فأسأل الله الذي أكرم مقامك وأكرمني بك أن يرزقني طلب ثارك مع إمام منصور من أهل بيت محمد صلى الله عليه وآله اللهم اجعلني عندك وجيها بالحسين عليه السلام في الدنيا والآخرة يا أبا عبد الله إني أتقرب إلى الله وإلى رسوله وإلى أمير المؤمنين وإلى فاطمة وإلى الحسن وإليك بموالاتك وبالبراءة ممن قاتلك ونصب لك الحرب وبالبراءة ممن أسس أساس الظلم والجور عليكم وأبرأ إلى الله وإلى رسوله ممن أسس أساس ذلك وبنى عليه بنيانه وجرى في ظلمه وجوره عليكم وعلى أشياعكم برئت إلى الله وإليكم منهم وأتقرب إلى الله ثم إليكم بموالاتكم وموالات وليكم وبالبراءة من أعدائكم والناصبين لكم الحرب وبالبراءة من أشياعهم وأتباعهم إني سلم لمن سالمكم 
وحرب لمن حاربكم وولي لمن والاكم وعدو لمن عاداكم فأسأل الله الذي أكرمني بمعرفتكم ومعرفة أوليائكم ورزقني البراءة من أعدائكم أن يجعلني معكم في الدنيا والآخرة وأن يثبت لي عندكم قدم صدق في الدنيا والآخرة وأسأله أن يبلغني المقام المحمود لكم عند الله وأن يرزقني طلب ثاري مع إمام هدى ظاهر عاطق بالحق منكم وأسأل الله بحقكم وبالشأن الذي لكم عنده أن يعطيني بمصابي بكم أفضل ما يعطي مصابا بمصيبته مصيبة ما أعظمها وأعظم رزيتها في الإسلام وفي جميع السماوات والأرض اللهم اجعلني في مقامي هذا من من تناله منك صلوات ورحمة ومغفرة اللهم اجعل محياي محيا محمد وآل محمد ومماتي ممات محمد وآل محمد اللهم إن هذا يوم تبركت به بن أمية وابن آكلة الأكباد اللعين ابن اللعين على لسانك ولسان نبيك صلى الله عليه وآله في كل موطن وموقف وقف فيه نبيك صلى الله عليه وآله اللهم لعن أبا سفيان ومعاوية ويزيد ابن معاوية عليهم منك اللعنة أبد الآبدين وهذا يوم فرحت به آل زياد وآل مروان بقتلهم الحسين صلوات الله عليه اللهم فضاعف عليهم اللعن منك والعذاب الأليم اللهم إني أتقرب إليك في هذا اليوم وفي موقفي هذا وأيام حياتي بالبراءة منهم واللعنة عليهم وبموالاة لنبيك وآل نبيك عليه وعليهم السلام اللهم لعن أول ظالم ظلم حق محمد وآل محمد وآخر تابع له على ذلك اللهم لعن العصابة التي جاهدت الحسين وشايعت وبايعت وتابعت على قتله اللهم لعنهم جميعا السلام عليك يا أبا عبد الله وعلى الأرواح التي حلت بفنائك عليك مني سلام الله أبدا ما بقيت وبقي الليل والنهار ولا جعله الله آخر الأحد مني لزيارتكم altogether السلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين اللهم خص أنت أول ظالم باللعن مني وابدأ به أولا ثم لعن الثاني والثالث والرابع اللهم لعن يزيد خامسا 
ولعن عبيد الله بن زياد وابن مرجانه وعمر بن سعد والشمرا وآل أبي سفيان وآل زياد وآل مروان إلى يوم القيامة اللهم لك الحمد حمد الشاكرين لك على مصابهم الحمد لله على عظيم رزيتي اللهم ارزقني شفاعة الحسين يوم الورود وثبت لي قدم صدق عندك مع الحسين وأصحاب الحسين الذين بذلوا مهجهم دون الحسين عليه السلام صلوا على محمد وآل محمد Let us welcome Sheikh Imam Nasser al-Din with the lecture tonight. With a loud salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. In honor of Abi Abdullah al Hussein, I pray for the Prophet Muhammad and the Prophet Muhammad. I pray for the Lord from the Satan. In the name of Allah, the Most Gracious. والحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على المصطفى محمد وآله الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وآل صلى الله عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي يا رسول الله صلى الله عليك وعلى أهل بيتك المظلومين صلى الله عليك يا مولاي وابن مولاي يا أبا عبد الله يا رحمة الله الواسعة ويا باب نجاة الأمة غريب يا مظلوم كربلا يا ليتنا يا ليتنا كنا معكم سادتي فنفوز والله فوزا عظيما إمام الصادق صلوات الله عليه is narrated to have said علي بن الحسين cried over his father Hussein, son of Ali, Salawatullahi alayhima for 20 years. According to another tradition, he says for 40 years. Whenever food would be placed in front of him, he would cry for Al Hussein, Salawatullahi alayhi. Why? Because he would remember 
that his father passed away and was killed as he was hungry. Whenever food would be placed in front of him, he would cry for Al Hussein, salawatullahi alayhi, and he maintained this behavior until one day one of his slaves said to him, May I be sacrificed for you? O grandson of Allah's Messenger, I fear that if you maintain this behavior, you will die. And so Imam al sajjad salawatullah told him, Innama ashku bathi wa huzni ila Allah wa a'lamu min Allah ma la ta'lamun. I solely complain to Allah in regards to my sorrow and distress, and I know from Allah that which you do not know. Then he said this word, he said, whenever I remember the killing of the progeny of Fatima, I choke and cry. Indeed, Sayyidi, Ya Zain al Abidin. Your tragedies after your father Hussein cause our hearts to melt. Just as the tragedies of your father Hussein cause our hearts to melt. May Allah bless the soul of the poet as he says, Wala fatah, wala fatahu ala khuzanati almika sajjad. وهو يجر بالأصفاد آه The poet says Oh the grief I feel Over he who inherited your knowledge Ya Aba Abdullah Oh the grief I feel for Zain al-Abideen As he was chained and was being dragged by his enemies What was he saying? He was calling out, he was shouting, Oh, grandfather, where is my tribe? Where are my honorable family members? Where are my honorable family members? Where are the people who used to love me and I used to love? لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم. الله سبحانه وتعالى سد له من القرآن. فأما الإنسان إذا ما ابتلاه ربه فأكرمه ونعم فيقول ربي أكرما in honor of Imam Hussein and Zain al Abidin صلى الله عليه وسلم وآل محمد in yesterday's مجلس we shed light on a third verse in Surah Al-Fajr that pertains to Imam al Hussein Salawatullah Alayh and Karbala. And that was the verse which says, وَتُحِبُّونَ الْمَالَ حُبًّا جَمَّةً We mentioned the Islamic stance on money or wealth and acquiring money or wealth. First of all, we mentioned that Al-Quran Al-Kareem informs us that our wealth is a test. Allah Ta'ala tests us through money, through wealth. Secondly, we mentioned that money is praised by Ahlul Bayt, praised by Islam, and acquiring money is also praised if the human being uses that money the way Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala wants him to use it. Whereas, Islam, Ahlul Bayt, Salawatullah Alayhim, they dispraise money and acquiring money. If what? If a person, they dispraise money and the love a person might have for money or wealth, if he misuses his wealth. 
if he lets the love of money overwhelm his soul and or uses the money in a way that displeases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Tonight, in our final majlis in this Ashura series, we're going to shed light on two other verses in Surah Al-Fajr that also greatly pertain to the tragedy of Imam al Hussein alayhi afdal salat wassalam. And I believe you'll be able to make the connection quickly as soon as you hear these verses. They are verses 15 and 16 in which Allah says, فَأَمَّا الْإِنسَانِ إِذَا مَبْتَلَاهُ رَبُّهُ فَأَكْرَمَهُ وَنَعَمَهُ فَيَقُولُ رَبِّي أَكْرَمًا Before reading the second verse, let us see what is Allah Ta'ala saying in the first verse and then we'll go to the second one. Firstly, Allah Ta'ala is speaking about the human being. Which human is he talking about? Here we have two interpretations. One says Allah Ta'ala is talking about the disbeliever. A second interpretation says he's talking about humans in general. Not about every single human, but he's talking about a good amount of humans. Telling you that in general, humans have the following mentality. And the mentality you shall hear is wrong. Allah Ta'ala mentions it and then tells you this is a wrong mentality. This is wrong. You should not have such a mentality if you are Muslim or are a believer. So he says, فَأَمَّا الْإِنسَانُ إِذَا مَبْتَلَاهُ رَبُّهُ فَأَكْرَمَهُ وَنَعَمَهُ He says, when the human being is tested by Allah Ta'ala, and Allah tests him through what? Through blessings. Allah bestows blessings upon him. He bestows richness, for example. He bestows health and other forms of blessings on this human being. What does the human being assume when he sees that Allah Ta'ala is bestowing blessings upon him? He assumes that he's honorable. فَيَقُولُ رَبِّي أَكْرَمًا He says, my Lord has honored me. I'm honorable in the eyes of Allah. Meaning, I have a lofty position in the eyes of Allah. What's your proof? Well, look at me. I'm rich. I'm healthy. I have plenty of blessings. This is my proof. This is the proof that I am what? Close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Such a mentality might lead him to what? Might lead him to deviation. Might lead him to sin because he truly believes that he's what? He's, he's way up there. He's really close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But Allah Ta'ala tells us in Surah Al-Fajr, this is what? This is ibtila. This is a test. Ibtalahu. I'm testing him through these blessings to see if he's going to thank me or not. And I believe you know that thankfulness is of two types. Verbal thankfulness by saying, for example, Alhamdulillah. And practical thankfulness by obeying Allah Jalla Jalla. Then he says, subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says, وَأَمَّا إِذَا مَبْتَلَاهُ فَقَدَرَ عَلَيْهِ رِزْقَهُ فَيَقُولُ رَبِّي أَهَانًا Allah says, whereas when Allah tests the human being not by widening his sustenance, rather by tightening it, by reducing his sustenance. Allah decrees, for example, to give a specific human being a small amount of wealth, not a large amount of wealth. Or Allah decrees that someone goes through sickness, that someone loses his health for a certain wise reason. When this happens, what does the human being say? The human being says, my Lord has insulted me. My Lord has has oppressed me and has belittled me. So he believes that he doesn't have a high position in the eyes of Allah. Rather, he has a low one. He says, if I was honorable in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I wouldn't be going through this misery. I wouldn't be going through this type of hardship or these types of hardships. 
Whereas Allah says what? He says this is an imtihan. It's a test. It's a test of what? A test of patience. And yesterday we said, Alama Niraka Rahmatullah says what? You cannot detach patience from thankfulness. If you're thankful, you're patient. If you're patient, you're thankful. These two are what? Inseparable. So what does Allah Ta'ala have to say about this mentality? Allah says right after, He says, Kalla. Kalla. Nay. Which means what? It means this is the wrong mentality. If you see yourself surrounded by blessings, this does not mean that you're close to Allah. And if you see that tragedies are being poured on you one after the other, it does not mean that Allah hates you. On the contrary, it might mean Allah loves you and loves you dearly. What's the proof? Other than these verses. Other than these verses, what's the proof? Well, do you want any proof better than Ahlul Bayt, sallallahu alayhim? Ahlul Bayt were the closest to God. I believe we all know that, right? Muhammad wa al Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi were the best of God's creations, the closest creations to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They're at the top of the, of the pyramid, right? Well, what happened to Ahlul Bayt in this world? They had the worst calamities. By far the worst calamities. The most painful, heartbreaking, bitterful calamities. And so, that's a proof. It's a proof that if you are going through hardship, it does not mean Allah Ta'ala despises you or Allah Ta'ala detests you. Here I recall an interesting story pertaining to Al-Khidr and Musa. Alayhima salam. Al Khidr and Musa salamullah alayhima, Allah Ta'ala mentions their story, what happened when they were together in Surah Al Kahf. And I believe all of you have read Surah Al Kahf. Before that story happens, the story regarding the boat, the boy, and the wall, what happens? Imam al Rida salawatullah wa salamu alayhi says, as you can find in Tafsir al Qummi. He says, Musa salamullah alayhi came to Al Khidr. Where was Al Khidr? He was on an island. And Khidr was sitting down or was leaning on something, maybe a wall or a tree. So when Musa came, he said, Salamu alaykum, peace be upon you. Al Khidr alayhi salam was surprised. Who is saying, Salamu alaykum? Why was he surprised? The Imam says back then, at that time, there was no salam, there was no peace on earth. There was no state of peace. So Khidr was surprised. Who's saying salamu alaykum? He told Musa, Who are you? He told him, I'm Musa, son of Imran. Now remember, Al Khidr is a scholar, he's, he's an erudite and he's infallible. He told him, Musa ibn Imran, the one that Allah Ta'ala spoke to, he told him, Yes. So Khidr told him, what do you want? As in, what can I do for you? What's your need? He told him, he told him, I have come so you may teach me from what you have been taught. And the point behind this is so I may be guided, as in I may gain more guidance. So Khidr told him what? Al Khidr salam told him the following. He told him, I've been commanded to uphold a command that you cannot withstand. And you've been commanded to uphold a command that I cannot withstand. This, my brothers and sisters, is a golden statement that we need to understand because it will clarify for us why Musa kept on objecting to Al-Khidr when Khidr did what he did in the story mentioned in Surah Al-Kahf. Al-Khidr tells him what? Al-Khidr tells him, I have been commanded to uphold a command that you cannot withstand. What is that command? The duty of Al-Khidr was to deal with things as they are. Meaning, 
to deal with things based on reality. Musa alayhi salam on the other hand, Khidr tells him, you've been commanded to uphold a command that I cannot withstand. Musa, his duty was to deal with things as they appear, not as they truly are. By now, I know plenty of you are saying, what in the world does that mean? Right? Your words are very vague, I know. Let me give you an example. Let me give you an example. Suppose two people came to Musa and Khadr alayhim as -salam. These two individuals were having a dispute over a piece of land. One was called Zaid and one was called Amr. So they came to Musa, salamullah alayhi. And they said, Ya Musa, judge between us. You know, Zaid says, this land is mine. Amr says, no, it's mine. Musa will do what? Because he's commanded to deal with things as they appear, he's in need of apparent proof, apparent evidence to give his judgment. So suppose that Zaid will bring two witnesses. So tell him, Ya Musa, I have two witnesses who testify for me that the land is mine. Amr, on the other hand, the poor man doesn't have any evidence that the land is his. So Musa will do what? Musa will say the land belongs to Zayd. Done deal. Al Khidr, on the other hand, if they came to Khidr, Khidr, remember, this is just, this is just an example. Al Khidr, is told by God, for example, the land belongs to Amr. It doesn't belong to Zayd. So now they come to Al Khadr. Again, Amr has no proof that the land is his. Zayd has proof. He has witnesses testifying that the land is his. What will Khadr do? Al Khadr will give the land to Amr. Because Allah tells him, Ya Khadr. The land in reality belongs to Amr. Yes, he has no proof, but it's his. If you've understood the example, you'll understand why Musa and Khadr salam, could not continue their journey together. Musa cannot withstand Khadr's command and vice versa. Then what happened? Imam Rida says, Salawatullah wa salamu alayhi. He says, then Al-Khidr began telling Musa about the tragedies of Ahlul Bayt. He began narrating the tragedies that will befall Ahlul Bayt and what they will go through due to the plots of their enemies. So both of them began crying bitterly. For who? Ahlul Bayt, sallallahu alayhi wa Al Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa Then, Khadr began narrating for Musa the virtues of Ahlul Bayt and how important and excellent Ahlul Bayt are to the point Musa said, I wish I was from Ali Muhammad. How about the second salawat? He said, I wish I was from Al Muhammad Salawatullah wa salamu alayhim. Realize, we have two points to mention here. Number one, Musa was a great prophet, one of the top prophets, one of the five greatest prophets alayhim salam. Yet, when he hears the virtues of Ahlul Bayt, he says, I wish I was one of them. So Ahlul Bayt are at the top of the pyramid, yet their tragedies are what? Bitterful. To the point the previous Prophet him, cried for their tragedies. Isa, Musa, Ibrahim, Adam, you name it. The previous Prophet him, they cried over the tragedies of Ahlul Bayt. Secondly, look at what Khidr and Musa do. Khidr mentions the virtues of Ahlul Bayt. And he mentions their masa'ib, their tragedies. Musa, on the other hand, does what? He listens, right? Isn't that what we do in our majalis? When we come to the majalis of Imam al-Husayn, for example, don't we narrate the virtues of Ahlul Bayt 
and don't we mention lessons that we derive from their life and then we conclude with what tragedies the tragedies that befell ahlul bayt alayhim salat was salam so what's your point you'll tell me my point is when you come to the majlis and you listen you're following the footsteps of musa alayhi salam and the person who's coming to speak is following the footsteps of who al khadr alayhi salam so it's a win-win scenario whether you're the listener or the speaker we all come out as we're successful inshallah subhanahu wa ta'ala so we understand from the verses of surah al-fajr and from the biography of ahlul bayt that if you go through misery in your life, you go through hard moments, sad moments in your life, that does not mean Allah Ta'ala hates you. You know, when we're going through tough moments in life, we might think, where is Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala? Why is Allah doing this to me? Surah Al-Fajr tells you what? Watch out. Be careful. Your tragedy does not mean Allah hates you. On the contrary. It might mean Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala really loves you. Really loves you. And so here a question comes to mind. Why? Why would the believer go through discomfort in this world? We've understood that traditions say this world is the prison of the believer. And I believe it's clear by now that every believer has to go through some sort of discomfort when he is in this current world some sort of discomfort even if it's minimal now the discomfort doesn't have to be huge it doesn't have to be major but but if you're a mu'min you will go through some sort of hardship even if it's minimal hardship even if the hardship consists of a fly you know flying over your head touching your nose and your ear bugging you every once in a while. That's discomfort. Even if the discomfort is what? Is a moment of anxiety. For example, I'll give you a very simple example that we can all relate to. As you're in the majlis, you lose your phone. Right? You lose your phone. And you look for it. Oh my God, where's my phone? Right? You look for it. And you go through a minute or two of weariness. Of anxiety that's what that's discomfort that is discomfort so the mu'min the believer will go through some sort of discomfort in this world depending on his level the discomfort might be minimal or it might be huge what do the traditions say the higher your position is in the eyes of Allah the greater what the greater your calamities will be hence truly we should think here about Sayyida Zainab alayha, and how high her position was because her masaib were beyond impeccable beyond heartbreaking can you think of a person who had tragedies worse than worse than Sayyida Zainab alayha, other than Ahl al-Kisa salamullah alayhim you can't so her position in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is beyond outstanding beyond impeccable beyond description so the question is without taking too much of your time before we go to the narration of the burial and we hear how Imam al-Sajjad alayhi, buries his father why why would the believer go through discomfort in this world? Why? Before I tell you why, we need to understand that we cannot claim to know all the secrets pertaining to our lives. See, Allah's decree is quite mysterious. And some things that happen in your life, you might not know why they happened. Will Allah Ta'ala uncover the reason in the hereafter? Maybe. It's up to him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. But some parts of your life are truly mysterious. The decree itself, the decree of Allah is mysterious. Hence, there might be reasons behind the occurrence of certain events in your life that you don't know and you will not know until you pass away. Then again, 
then again, if we think and we refer to Ahlul Bayt, then we can at least come out with several reasons as to why the believer goes through hardship or discomfort in this world. The first one is what? The first one is purification from sins. See, when you're a believer, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves you. And Allah ta'ala wants you to go to heaven. Heaven will be your abode in the hereafter. But the problem is what? Believers are not infallible, right? Excluding Ahlul Bayt and the prophets, excluding the infallibles. Most believers are what? They're fallible. And sometimes we fall into mistakes, into sins here and there. Now Allah loves you. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you to dwell in eternal happiness once you go to the hereafter. But at the same time, you've committed one sin, ten sins, a thousand sins, multiple sins. Thus, you might need what? You might need cleansing. You might need cleansing. Can Allah Ta'ala forgive these sins without, you know, afflicting you with any type of hardship? Of course He can. But will that be the wisest thing to do? Maybe, maybe not. What I mean to say is Allah Ta'ala might sometimes forgive you without, without afflicting you with a hardship. He might. Why? Because of a good deed you've done in the past or because of a good deed you do after you sin. But sometimes Allah sees that the wisest thing is to actually afflict you with some sort of hardship to teach you a lesson, for example. Hence, the hardships we go through cleanse us from our sins. What type of hardships? The major hardships? Yes. What about the minor ones? Even the minor ones. Even something as small as a minute of anxiety. Even something as small as a paper cut. Even something as small as tripping. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses that to do what? To cleanse you from your sins. What's the proof? Here's the proof. Or actually, here's one proof. We have plenty of narrations that confirm what we just mentioned. But here's one proof. If we go to the book Tuhaf al uqul we find a narration by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi which says, Ma asab al mu'min min nasabin wala wasabin wala huznin hatta al ham yahummuh illa kaffar allahu bihi anhu min sayyati. The Prophet says sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi whenever a believer goes through fatigue or he goes through pain and sickness, or he goes through sorrow, or he goes through a state of anxiety, he feels worried, Allah uses, uses what? Uses the anxiety, or the sickness, or the pain, or the sorrow, or the fatigue, to demolish the sins of the believer. Look at how merciful he is, subhanahu wa ta'ala, because he loves you. He wants you to come to him in the hereafter as you're completely cleansed. When you're completely cleansed, you're ready for what? You're ready for heaven. Ready to dwell in eternal happiness. So that's one reason. Is there a second reason why believers must go through some sort of discomfort in this world? Yes, there is. A second reason is to wake us up and to remind us about the reality of this world. You see, when, when everything flows perfectly, when everything flows perfectly, and you see yourself surrounded by blessings, for example, you have a job, you're married, you have children, your parents and siblings are all doing fine, you're all living in a good state, you're all living in peace, you're acquiring your sustenance. At that point, when everything flows perfectly, you might go through a state of spiritual sleep. You might start to say, you know what? This world is not too bad. It's actually pretty nice. And as a result, little by little, you might start to 
enjoy your life on earth and you might start to love love the dunya you might start to love this world and you might become so attached to it that you don't want to leave it when you get to that state this is where you will be closer to deviation closer to slowly drifting away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so Allah ta'ala does what Allah Azza wa Jal sends you discomfort, even if it's minimal, to remind you of the reality of this world. Allah Ta'ala, you know, sends you a wake-up call. Wake up! You don't understand the reality of this world. Have you forgotten? This is just a temporary abode. This is not your final life. Your real life, your final life is in the hereafter. Don't become too attached to it. There's no problem in what? In dwelling in peace. There's no problem in enjoying yourself as you are, enjoying your life as you are in this world in a halal way, in a lawful way. But don't become attached to a dunya. That was one of the main messages of Imam al Hussein, salawatullah wa salam alayh, in his what? In his sermon on the day of. Hashura. Because when you become attached to it, what's going to happen? You're going to slowly drift away from Allah. So Allah Ta'ala sends you wake-up calls. One day, you get sick. La ilaha illallah. Now I'm feeling discomfort. One day, you trip. One day, you lose a family member. Here you remember. You wake up. All right. Yes, sahih. This world is not our final abode. It's temporary. Right now we're just, you know, lying down under the shade of a tree. Sooner or later, someone will come and tell us what? It's time to go. Let's go. It's time to go to the real abode. So that's the second reason why Allah Ta'ala lets us feel discomfort. A third and final reason is elevating your status. Again, Allah Ta'ala loves the believer. He loves him. And Allah Azza wa Jal sees that, MashaAllah, you're doing good. You're doing very well. Based on your deeds, you're going to reach, say, the first level of heaven. Allah Ta'ala doesn't want you to dwell there only. Although dwelling there is beyond fantastic. Right? If we can be saved from Jahannam, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. But Allah Ta'ala has something much better for you, has something planned much better for you. Allah wants you to be in Al Firdaus, in the highest level of heaven, with you know Imam Al Hussein Salawatullah wa salamuhu alayh beside you. He wants you to be between Imam Al Hussein and Abu Al Fadl in heaven. But Allah sees that your actions are weak. Your actions are not enough to take you there. So he does what? He bestows calamities on you. Through those calamities, when you bear them and endure them and remain patient, you elevate. You get to higher stations. What's the proof? We have plenty of proof. Amongst the proof is the following. The following narration which you can find in Mizan al-Hikmah. Imam al-Sadiq says, Salawatullah wa salamu alayhi, Man ibtulia min shi'atina fa sabar, fa sabara alayhi kana lahu ajr alf shaheed. He says, when one of our followers is afflicted with hardship and remains patient over that hardship, Allah Ta'ala gives him the reward of how many martyrs? A thousand. A thousand martyrs. Imagine. The likes of me and you, we ask Allah for shahada, right? We ask him to become martyrs so we can get the reward of one martyr. The Imam says, if you are patient during hardships and you follow us, Ahlul Bayt, you will get the reward of a thousand martyrs. Can you explain that reward for us, Ya Hammam? No, I can't. How can I? I can't. We can't even begin to imagine what Allah Ta'ala will give you if he is giving you the reward of a thousand martyrs. A thousand martyrs. In a second tradition, Imam al-Baqir sallallahu alayhi says, also in Mizan al-Hikmah, 
لو يعلم المؤمن ما له في المصائب من الأجر لتمنى أن يقرض بالمقاريض He says if the believer knew how much reward he receives for enduring tragedies he would have wished to be severed into pieces with what? With scissors. Can you imagine how painful that would be? Someone using, you know, an ugly scissor to kind of cut your limbs, one limb after the other. That's painful. The believer, when he sees what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives people on the Day of Judgment for the tragedies that befell them, he will wish that when he was here, he had been severed into pieces to gain more and more rewards. So these are three reasons, my brothers and sisters, why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala afflicts believers with discomfort or say allows them to go through discomfort in pain and tragedies in this world. Going back to the verses in Surah Al-Fajr, Allah says what? فَأَمَّا الْإِنسَانُ إِذَا مَا ابْتَلَاهُ رَبُّهُ فَأَكْرَمَهُ وَنَعَمَهُ فَيَقُولُ رَبِّي أَكْرَمًا وَأَمَّا إِذَا مَا ابْتَلَاهُ فَقَدَرَ عَلَيْهِ رِزْقَهُ فَيَقُولُ رَبِّي أَهَانًا How does that pertain to Imam Al-Husayn and Karbala? صلوات الله وسلام عليك يا أبا عبد الله I think the connection is very clear. Very clear. On the day of Ashura, close to Maghrib, where was Imam al Hussein? On the dust of Karbala, right? His body was being trampled by horses. But who was al Hussein? Habibullah, the beloved of God and the son of his beloved. Yazid was where? Yazid was in his palace on his comfortable bed. Doing God knows what. He was comfortable. But he was what? Baghidullah. The one Allah despises. You see? So the two verses pertain to Karbala. They connect to Karbala really well. The connection is wide and clear. Yes. The connection is wide and clear. On a day like today, where were Zainab? Um Kulthum, Sukayna bint al Hussein, Fatima bint al Hassan, Fatima bint al Hussein, Zainul Abidin. Where were they? They were in captivity. On a day like today, they enter Al Kufa. Zainab enters Al Kufa, Salawatullah wa Salamuhu alayha. Allahu Akbar. Zainab enters Al Kufa as she is a captive. See, some of you have been to Kufa. And those who haven't, inshallah, Allah Ta'ala grants you the honor of going to Kufa. When you go to Kufa, even today, year 2022, and you go to the mosque of Al Kufa, you feel that Amir Al Mu'mineen, salamullah alayhi, is right there, right beside you. And he's, he's delivering his sermon on the pulpit of Kufa. You feel that there is a Alawi atmosphere. You feel like you're smelling the fragrance of Ali ibn Abi Talib sallallahu alayhi wa Zainab enters Al-Kufa as a captive. You could imagine what she feels when she enters the capital of her own father. 20 years ago, she was, she was the princess of Kufa, the daughter of Amir al-Mu'mineen. And today she's a captive. Salamullah alayha. Yes? On a day like tomorrow, the 13th day of Muharram, Imam al-Sajjad salamullah alayhi breaks free. From what? From the prison of Ubaidullah bin Ziyad. Why? To bury Imam al Hussein. How does he break free? Using obviously miracles, supernatural powers. He breaks free with Allah's permission and goes to Karbala to bury the Imam. The Imam cannot be left without burial until the Day of Judgment. The Imam... The next Imam has to bury him. So the Imam broke free and he came. But before he arrived, what was happening? There was a group from Banu Asad who came to Karbala once Umar bin Sa'ad left. 
This group, consisting of men and women, they were good people. They weren't bad. The traditions praised them. They were good people. They were mu'mineen. So they came to Karbala, and they resided close to the Euphrates. Now, on day 13, their women went to bring water from the Euphrates, only to see something they did not expect to see. They saw a few bodies lying on the coast of the Euphrates, and bodies that were distant from the Euphrates, and they realized that there was one body amongst those bodies that was overwhelming the rest of the bodies with light and with its beautiful fragrance. Which body was that? Which body? Abu Abdullah al Hussein sallallahu alayhi wa What was surprising is that these people had been killed, but their blood was still gushing out of their bodies. That was a miracle. That was a miracle. If someone gets killed, the blood will not keep on get gushing out of the body for three days. It was a miracle. So the women were surprised and they screamed and said, we swear by Allah, this is al Hussein salawatullah salamu alayhi. These are his family members and these are his companions. They came back to the tent, to the camp. They came back screaming. They told their man, Ya Bani Asad, Banu Asad, you are sitting in your tent when the bodies of Hussein, his family members and companions are left on the dust, lying like sacrificial lambs. They're slaughtered and the wind is blowing dust on those bodies. What will you tell Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi? What will you tell Amir al muminin What will you tell Fatima al Zahra, Salamullahi alayhim, when you go to them? When you did not support their progeny, you did not use a sword to strike their enemy, nor a spear to stab their enemy, nor did you shoot an arrow, one single arrow at the enemy. What will you tell Ahl al -Bayt? The man, they said, we fear Banu Umayyah. Meaning, if we go and we bury Imam al Hussein and his family and companions, maybe one of the spies of Banu Umayyah will see us. And as a result, Umar bin Sa'ad and Ubaidullah bin Ziyad will come after us. So the woman said, if you were not able to support Imam al Hussein and his family and companions, then the least you could do is go and bury them. Rise, go and bury them. And if you're not going to do it, we're going to do it. So they gave them two choices either you do it or we do it. Here the men saw they had no choice, so they rose. They came to the bodies. They appointed one of them to look at the pathway which leads to Kufa. In case anyone comes from Kufa, he'll tell them so they move away from the bodies. So they came, and it seems that although the bodies were decapitated, there were no heads, they were able to tell who was Imam al Hussein salawatullah wa salamu alayhi from the light of the Imam and from the signs of Imama they were able to tell this was Al Hussein so they surrounded the body of the Imam and they began wailing and crying you can't begin to imagine what a follower of Ahlul Bayt would feel if he actually saw the body of Imam Al Hussein salawatullah wa salamuhu alayh. so they began wailing and crying then they came and they tried to move one of his limbs just one, collectively, but they failed. They weren't able to. They could not even move one of his limbs. Why? Because that's the heaviness of imama. That heaviness cannot be 
cannot be withstood by anyone other than an imam. Only an imam can actually bury an imam. So they failed. Hence, their leader said what? He said, let us bury his family members first and his companions, and then we'll see what we'll do with him. They agreed. They were about to do that, but one of them objected. La ilaha illallah. What's happening? He said, how are you going to bury the rest of the bodies? How? When, as you can see, they have no heads. And we cannot tell who is who. If we bury them, and tomorrow we're asked, whose grave is this? What will we say? It was a true predicament. What can we say? We don't know who these people are. As in, we don't know who's who. At that moment, a Faris, a knight appeared. This was Imam al-Sajjad. But they did not recognize him. A knight appeared. He had placed a mask over his face and, and ha over his face and had tightened the mask. He came. Salamullah alayhi. And he descended from his horse. When he descended from his horse, Imam al-Sajjad Salamullah alayhi began walking as his back was bent. And he began going through the bodies, body after body, body after body. It seems that he's looking for a specific body. And I believe all of us know which body he wants. Salawatullah wa salamu alayh. He kept on moving until he got to the body of Imam al Hussein. What does he do? Sahadallah qalbaka sayyidi. He throws himself on the body of Aba Abdullah, embraces it as he's crying, and he wets his face mask with his tears. He begins kissing Aba Abdullah, salawatullah wa salamu alayh. He smells the fragrance of Hussein and he addresses Abba Abdullah saying, Ya Abata, Ya Abata, Bikatlika Karrat Ayun Shamiti. O oh, Father, after you, those who rejoice at our misfortune began rejoicing. يا أبتا بقتلك فرحت بنو أمية Oh Father, when you were killed, Banu Umayya rejoiced. Ya Abata, Ba'daka Tala Karbuna. Oh Father, Oh Father, after you, our sorrow is everlasting. Oh Father, after you, our distress is everlasting. Allah. Then Imam Zain al Abidin Salawatullah turned to Banu Asad. When he came, they pulled themselves away from the bodies. So he turned to them and he said, Why did you stand beside these bodies? They told him, We came to look at the bodies. And so the Imam said, No. That was not your intention. It seems at that point they felt safe. They felt that they could tell him the truth. Ultimately, this was their Imam, but they had not recognized him. And so they said, Oh, brother of the Arabs, now we are going to tell you what was our intention. We came and we stood beside these bodies because we wanted to bury Abba Abdullah al Hussein and his family members and companions. But when you came, we thought that you were from the men of Ibn Ziyad, and so we pulled away from the bodies. Ajarakumullah. And so at that point, Imam al Sajjad, salawatullah wa salam made a line on the ground and told Banu Asad, dig over here. And so they dug a grave. Then he told them to place the bodies, 17 bodies in that grave. These were the bodies of Banu Hashim, salamullah alayhim. 
Then Abba, then Imam Sajjad, Salamullah Alayhi, drew another line on the ground and he told them to dig a grave over there. So they dug the grave. Then he told them to place all of the rest of the bodies, excluding the body of Hussein and the body of Habib bin Mudahir in that grave. So they placed 70 bodies in that grave, the bodies of the companions, Rahmatullah ta'ala alayhim. Then Imam al-Sajjad Salamullah alayh told them to dig a grave close to where Imam al Hussein is buried today. They dug that grave and told them to place the body of Habib bin Mudair in that grave. When that was done, Imam al Sajjad Salamullah alayh came to the body of Aba Abdullah. But before reaching his body, Imam al Sajjad lifted a bit of sand from the ground and found a grave that was prepared for Aba Abdullah. Allahu Akbar. Who prepared that grave? The tradition says it was Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Yes, Rasulullah prepared the grave for Aba Abdullah al Hussein. And so Imam Zain al Abideen Salawatullahi Alaihi went, he walked to the body of Aba Abdullah. When Banu Asad saw this, they followed him. They wanted to help him. And so the Imam said, with full humbleness and humility, he said, Ana akfikum amra. I will bury him on my own. They were surprised. They said, O oh, brother of the Arabs, how could you bury him on your own when we all tried to move one of his limbs collectively and we were unable to do so? <laughs> Imam al Sajjad at that point cried and said, Inna man yu'inuni. I have someone with me who will help me. Who was that someone? The tradition says, as you can find in Al Kafi, it was Rasulullah, Amirul Bu'minin, and Al Hassan. Their souls came to carry Aba Abdullah with Zainul Abidi. Ajarakumullah, Imam al Sajjad came to carry his father, but it is sad when he tries to carry him. Every time he carried one part of Hussein, another part would fall down <laughs> because his body parts were severed. Asafiya alaik ya Aba Abdullah. And so he called Banu Asad, Ya Bani Asad, Alayya bi hasira. Bring me a mat made out of straw. They told him, what do you want to do with it? He said, I want to place the body parts of Hussein on it. حسين مطبر وجروحة كثيرة. The poet says he shouted, "Bring me a mat made out of straw." Hussein's body is critically wounded. Well, Mahwadarat عليه القام ديرة. Hussein was fought from all sides, oh people. He was receiving stabs from different directions. Ajarakumullah, <laughs> they brought him the mat. Imam Zainul Abidin placed the limbs of Hussein on it. Then he carried his father as he was saying, Bismillah, in the name of Allah, wa billah, and through Allah. Allah's power, wa fi sabilillah, and in the path of Allah, wa ala millati rasulillah, and on the path of Allah's messenger. This is what Allah and His messenger promised us.
and Allah and His Messenger were truthful. MashaAllah, la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah al ali al azim. Then he brought Aba Abdullah down to his grave. When he was inside the grave, Zainul Abidin placed his cheek on the severed neck of Aba Abdullah and began crying loudly. He addressed him with words that shatter the heart. He said, Tawba, لأرض إن تضمنت جسدك الطاهر. Congratulations to a land, to a land that will hold your pure body. أما الدنيا فبعدك مظلمة. As for this world, it has darkened after your departure. And as for the hereafter, it is shining with light. As for our sorrow, it is everlasting. Meaning, Father, from today until the day I meet you, I will never be happy. As for our sorrow, it is everlasting. And as for our nights, they are sleepless. This will be our state until Allah chooses for your family the realm in which you reside. وَعَلَيْكَ مِنِّ السَّلَامِ يَا ابْنَ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ وَرَحْمَةُ اللَّهِ وَبَرَكَاتُ and peace be upon you from me, O grandson of Allah's Messenger. And may Allah's mercy and blessings descend upon you. Ajarakumullah, then Imam al Sajjad, salawatullah alayhi, wanted to rise and get out from the grave. However, it is said at that moment, the voice of Hussein was heard by Zainul Abidin. A voice stemmed from his severed neck, telling him, My son Ali, place my baby beside my chest. Ah, well, ya boy, ya boy, ya boy, ya boy, ya tafel khalla ala sadri, as if he tells him. Oh, my son, place my baby beside my chest. Ya boy, ya tafel, khal ala sadri. Webrefej khal nahara ala nahari. Be gentle, ya Zayn al-Abideen, when you place its severed neck beside my severed neck. La yen lechem jar haya dhakhrim. Do not let its wound widen, ya Zayn al-Abideen. Ajarakum Allah. Then Imam al-Sajjad finished the burial. When the grave was closed, he wrote with his blessed finger the following statement on the grave of Hussein. He wrote, this is the grave of Hussein, son of Ali, son of Abi Talib, the one who was killed thirsty as he was in a foreign land. Aywa gariba. Then he told Banu Asad, Look around you. Do you see any more bodies that were left without burial? That are left without burial? They told him, Yes, there are three bodies left. There is a body of a warrior, <laughs> of a warrior lying on the coast of the Euphrates. And there are two bodies beside it. Every time we tried to carry the body of the warrior, his body parts would fall. 
due to the ab abundant amount of strikes and stabs it received. Naam. They were talking about Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas salawatullah wa salamu alayhi and so Imam al-Sajjad told them let us go to him. What happens to Imam al-Sajjad when he sees his uncle Abu al-Fadl? The tradition says when he comes to Abu al-Fadl he throws himself on the body of Abbas and he says ala dunya ba'daka al-afa Life is not worth living after you. O moon of the tribe, O moon of Banu Hashim. على الدنيا بعدك العفا يا قمر بني هاشم وعليك من السلام من شهيد محتسب ورحمة الله وبركاته and peace be upon you from me oh martyr who was pleased with allah's decree and rewards and may allah's mercy and blessings descend upon you <laughs> As if he says, Uncle Abbas, Uncle Abbas, after you, our enemies took us into captivity. Ya Amme Khilaf Anak, Ya Sarat Naadak, Loh El Mughar Wa Shahir Safak El Fattak. Uncle Abbas, rise, ride your horse and unsheath your destructive sword. Here is your flag, Ya Bufadil. Will you not rise and pick up your flag? Naim ya the kharazianab wa chalathuma. Are you sleeping? O oh, protector of Zainab and Um Kulthum. Ajarakum Allah. Then the Imam buried Abu al Fadl, subhanallah. When he wanted to bury him, he said to Banu Asad, I have someone with me who will help me, meaning I will bury him on my own. I do not want any one of you to come and pick up Abu al Fadl with me. And he told them to bury the two other bodies beside Abu al Fadl. When the burial was over, Imam al Sajjad went to his horse only to be surrounded by Banu Asad. They told him, O oh brother of the Arabs, you did not tell us to whom do these bodies belong? Who are these people who we buried? And so he told them, as for the grave of Hussein, you know it. You know which grave is the grave of Hussein, salawatullah alayh. As for the first grave that you dug, it is the grave of Banu Hashim. The closest one to them, the closest one to them to Aba Abdullah is his son Ali al Akbar. As for the second grave that you dug, it was the grave of the companions. As for the third grave, the one that is close to Hussein, that is the grave of Habib bin Mudahir al Asadi, Rahmatullah alayhi. Then he told them, as for the warrior that was beside, that was on the coast of the Euphrates, it, it is Al Abbas, son of Amir al Mu'mineen, alayhim as salam. And as for the two bodies that were beside Abbas, they are the children of Amir al Mu'mineen, salawatullah alayhi. And so at that point, they told him, O oh brother of the Arabs, we ask you for the sake of the body that you carried on your own, meaning the body of Hussein. Tell us, who are you? And so Imam al Sajjad cried bitterly and said, I am your Imam. <laughs> Ali ibn al Hussein. 
they were surprised. You are Ali ibn al Hussein. They were surprised. They said, Master, may Allah greatly reward you for the loss of your father Hussein. Ajarakumullah, then Zainul Abidin disappeared and went back to Kufa. Zainab Salamullah alayha was waiting for him. It is said she tells him, My nephew, where were you until this time? He told her, My aunt, I just finished burying my father, Abba Abdullah. I was burying Abba Abdullah al Hussein. Zainab's heart broke. She told him, My nephew, up until today, your father was left without burial. Yes, it was dear upon Zainab Salamullah alayah to hear that word. It was dear upon her for two reasons. One, because the Imam remained without burial for three days. And two, because now she knew that Abba Abdullah was buried. She was not going to see his blessed body after that day. It was dear upon Zainab to be separated from Abba Abdullah. Thus, as if she says to him, I will conclude with these lines of poetry. وشوف الطاهرة أمي وأخويا الحسن والكرار Brother Hussein, when I would see your face, I would see the face of Rasulullah Fatima Hassan and Ali صلوات الله عليهم وبوجودك وبوجهك من أصد يا حسين كان ما خلات من هالدار آه وبوجهك من أصد يا حسين كان ما خلات من هالدار شلون النوب باصرني من بعدك يا نور العين أبا عبد الله when I would see you in the house I would feel the presence of the five people of the cloak Abba Abdullah look at my state today and see what life has done to your beloved Zainab لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم وسيعلم الذين ظلموا أي منقلب ينقلبون توجهوا إلى الله تعالى اللهم إنا نسألك وندعوك بأحب الخلق إليك محمد وعليا وفاطمة والحسن والحسين والتسعة المعصومين من ذرية الحسين فرج عنا يا الله We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to hasten the reappearance of Sahib al-Zaman to make us from his sincere followers and supporters to forgive our sins to conceal our defects and to fulfill our needs. If anyone has a need, ask it and Allah Ta'ala will answer you. Allahumma bihaqqi imamina zayn al-abideen salawatullahi alayh iqdi hajata kulli muhtaj la siyama hawaij al-hadirin wal-mushahideen wa man sa'alani al-dua ya rabb al-alameen We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to heal all the sick believers for the sake of the sick Imam Zain al Abidin, salawatullahi alayhi. And we ask him to bless the souls of all believers who have passed away, especially our family members and friends, 
those who are completely forgotten and never mentioned, the great martyrs and the noble scholars. Ila arwahim jamian, wa ila arwahi amwatikum wa amwati, wa ila arwahi walidayya wa akhi wa habibi Hussain. Nab'athu thawab majlisina adha, wa thawab al-fatiha, tasbikuha salatun ala Muhammad, wa ali Muhammad.